is the burden and cost of reporting going forward? What's the secondary reason? Once you're able to do that and create more transparent disclosures, you're able to unlock capital. And this is particularly important to boost private sector investment in Africa. So this is why we're working on this. This is why we started this deep dive today, which is a short one, especially because for the financial sector, finance emissions is a critical part of S2 and also of disclosures going forward. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure on behalf of the Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria and also on behalf of NGX to invite my colleagues Arturo, who's going to give an overview of the first day, and also Jing, who's going to give you an insight into the metrics that are a very important proportionality measure in order to ensure that the material metrics and targets for your industry are covered. And What's perhaps worth mentioning as the very last point is that for the ISSB, the definition of materiality is exactly the same definition of materiality as you are used to from your accounting standards and from your financial statements. Um, welcome, really a great pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much, Antonia, and thank you very much to our hosts, NGX and Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria, who you will probably hear from in the closing um, address. Please remember to put your questions in the chat. There will be an FAQ so that even if your questions are not comprehensively addressed during the webinar, which is very short, it's only an hour, it will be comprehensively addressed subsequently. And the slides will be shared together with the opening slides that we had on day one. Have a great session. Thank you, Indidi. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to be with you again. Uh, you saw my face and heard my voice during day one. Uh, and the next uh, few minutes, I want to spend a little bit of time just get, giving you some of the key takeaways from that first session that we had a couple of days ago. Um, for those of you that were able to attend, you might remember that that session was divided into two sections. The first one looked at ISSB and its purpose and objectives, and of course, a high-level overview of S1 and S2. And the second section of that uh, first day uh, focused entirely on the SASB standards. So what you're seeing here uh, in uh, this slide is uh, four, key, uh, four key takeaways from that uh, first part of the general session. And uh, the first thing that I want to remind everybody is that uh, the work of the ISSB from day one has, all, has always uh, built upon the uh, principles, concepts, and indicators from existing voluntary frameworks and standards. Uh, chiefly, the TCFD recommendations, which of course are the uh, architecture of S1 and S2, uh, the integrated reporting framework, and also uh, the SASB standards were, uh, that we're here to, to talk about. Uh, in particular, for S1, which is our general requirements uh, document and standard, uh, the SASB standards are referenced in this document as priority material that can help companies identify sustainability-related risk and opportunities that have the potential to impact a company's ability to create, preserve, or uh, destroy value. Uh, secondly, in our uh, climate document, which is known as uh, S2, uh, the SASB standards are also playing an important role because this particular document uh, will be accompanied by industry-based illustrative guidance when it is published in a couple of weeks. Uh, and these uh, guidance incorporates the climate-related metrics from uh, the SASB standards. Finally, uh, the last key takeaway from that first uh, hour of the general session was that uh, the IFRS Foundation through the ISSB encourages companies to adopt the SASB standards as well as the TCFD recommendations and the integrated reporting framework to get prepared to implement S1 and S2 in the future. So um, then we had uh, an, another hour to talk about specifically uh, on the SASB standards. And I also have for you four key takeaways from that second hour of the general session. The, the first uh, key takeaway is that the SASB standards were designed originally to help uh, companies identify the sustainability topics, uh, risks, and opportunities that are reasonably likely to affect the financial condition, the operating performance, and or the risk profile of uh, companies working in a given industry or sector. 
As you may recall, uh, the universe of the SASB standards is comprised by 77 different standards for the same number of different industries. And uh, again, the value of having these specific look at industry by industry basis is that uh, one, uh, as a preparer of information or user of information, can really uh, zoom in into the risk and opportunities that affect companies within a given uh, industry and operating in the same uh, space as, as others. Thirdly, um, as Ndidi uh, hinted on earlier on, uh, the SASB uh, industry-based metrics uh, are in, in a way a proportionality measure because instead of focusing on a very broad array, uh, array of indicators and metrics, the SASB standards do focus on a limited set of topics and metrics that are linked to value creation and uh, as such are a cost-effective mechanism to start uh, sustainability disclosure journeys for companies in a given industry. And finally, the last thing that I want to mention before I hand it over to Jing to talk about the uh, SASB standards for the financial sector in particular, is that we do have a free online uh, resource called the SASB Implementation Primer that is uh, was designed to uh, work as a um, you know useful resource for companies to start their uh, reporting journeys with the SASB standards. So please do check that out in our website. Uh, the slides that uh, we presented in day one will have the link for these resource, uh, but if you cannot wait for those slides to uh, hit your inbox, you can always Google SASB implementation primer and uh, you will get to uh, these resource. So thank you again to uh, FRCN and NGX for hosting us today. And now uh, I will hand, hand it over to Jing to talk about the uh, SASB standards for the financial sector. Jing, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you, Arturo. Uh Good, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here today. Um, let me uh, bring my uh, slides up. Give me one second. I hope everybody can see the screen now. So today uh, we're going to focus on the industry uh, the financial sectors, the industry sp uh, specific guidance, uh, the SASB standard, and uh, as you as, as the other sessions, we we frame it as the implementation guidance, and um, this is for the, uh, the 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 sustainability general requirement. And in fact, today you will see that a lot of the uh, uh, disclosure topic metrics are also uh, relevant for the climate related disclosure requirement as well. So let's start with what are the industries we're actually talking about under the financial sector. Uh, there are seven of them, and you can see they're pretty com comprehensive, starting with asset management, custodial activities, commercial banks, consumer finance, insurance, investment banking, brokerage, mortgage finance, security, and commodity exchange. Uh, one thing we should note is that even though we call them industry classification, what we're really trying to get it is um, at business activities and business models. So what do we mean by this? You know, a very, very large conglomerate, if, if it actually has a financing arm and, uh, a, 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 and a non-financing part of the organization, if the financing part the arm is basically taking deposit and then provide the captive finance, provide loans, then actually that conglomerate need to report their commercial part of the entity under the commercial bank's set of metrics. So, so I think that's very important to note well, what we mean by industries. It's not just industry qualification, it's really try to get hard to the business activities and business model. 
Now, let's get into a little bit of more details about what we mean the industry specific um, disclosure topics. As uh, mentioned by Nididi and Arturo, the, the SASB standard has been developed based on very rigorous process, taking in a lot of market feedback through uh, extensive empirical research by looking at what are the relevant dis disclosure topics, uh, material to the investors for specific industries. And by doing so, what we have come up with a set of decision useful disclosure topics, metrics, and their material in the sense that you're quite familiar with from the uh, financial statement reporting. And we we're taking a lot of guesswork from the preparers as well as investors. What do we mean by that? So for example, if, a, you know, if, if, if you're a commercial bank and you look at this table and say, commercial banks, there's a set of uh, uh, dimensions that actually uh, based on SASB's research, they're, very, uh, they're going to be material and I need to look into them. I need to uh, disclose them, for example, and that covered data security, financial inclusion, um, uh, and capacity building, business ethics, et cetera. So you go down that column. And, and if you are mortgage finance, you're gonna pick that specific column of disclosure topics that uh, by all likelihood uh, will be material to, to you, to your investors. Now, this industry specific uh, setup really enable us to quickly identify uh, business critical sustainability, uh, sustainability issues. So here we're giving you an example uh, of two industries, insurance and asset management and uh, custodial activities. So for example, if you look at the dimensions that we listed out there on the left-hand side, you know, setting practice, report, uh, uh, product reporting, employment engagement, uh, DNI, product design and lifecycle management, etc., down to business ethics, and then you look at the specific disclosure topics for insurance uh, industry. If you are in that category, or if you actually are in the asset management uh, business, or you have a very large portion of the business. Uh, under asset management type of, uh, uh, of business model. And then those are the topics that you'll be looking, uh, uh, looking at in terms of reporting. I want to highlight that, you know, when we look at industry specific um, disclosure topics, uh, there are a set of disclosure topics that are common across industries. For example, for these two industries, the transparent information and fair advice for customers that are relevant for both of them. And they are um, uh, disclosure topics only specific for, for, for its own industry. So in this case, the environmental risk uh, uh, exposure, uh, that's if, if you're underwriting uh, you know, hazard insurance and if you're underwriting um, the, um, uh, uh, the, the home mortgage and, and the environmental risk can be very, very relevant to your business activities. And that may not be the case for asset management and custodial activities. Now, let's further get into um, zoom in and, and, and look at uh, these two industries and look at and, and use two examples of the disclosure topics and talk about what are the metrics and what are type of the financial drivers, why they're relevant and what are the potential financial impact. So, you know, follow the example we use um, the insurance uh, industry, take the disclosure topic of investment risk exposure the specifics metrics we're talking about here, and you can see that for those of you from that sectors, and those sounds very familiar. So for example, we're asking probable maximum loss 
of uh, insured product from weather-related natural catastrophes. So we're talking about hurricanes, uh, you know, uh, wildfires, etc. And uh, you know, we're asking the total amount of uh, monetary loss attributed to to uh, uh, to to the these insurance payout from these categories. Now, why do these metrics matter? And what are the, finan the, the typical financial drivers actually um, that will affect the financial impact? And obviously for these type of metrics, the impact will be on the cost side. And this definitely uh, affect the operational efficiency and the cost structure, cost structure right? And uh, if the claim due to hurricane and wildfire, and by the way, you know, in US, uh, the, the, the northeastern part right now are being affected by the wildfires out of actually Canada. Now, the, the, because of these extreme events due to weather related, the claims would be higher and that definitely affect cost. Now, moving on to the example of disclosure topics of business assets for asset management custodial activities, if I first want to highlight the financial impact of this, both on the cost and, and the revenue side. Uh, on the cost, and there are plenty of examples where on uh, ESCO behaviors from the asset manager, from you know various asset managers, in terms of miss sell, in terms of fail to disclose, and that really can get them into trouble and resulting in fines you know, regulatory constraint, et cetera. And that will increase the cost. Um, the other side of this coin is that we're talking about both risk and opportunities. Now, the, a, a firm, an asset manager uh, being ethical, that could be one, uh, give you potential competitive advantage because in you know, the customers, the stakeholders would like to deal with firms uh, which uh, are perceived to be ESCO in their dealing with the customers, with the suppliers uh, and other stakeholders. And that, you, that does affect it in the long-term uh, valuation of the business and, 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 and it's conducive to the revenue side. So, so, the, so there are financial impacts, what real financial impact we're talking about here. So, and what are the specific uh, metrics we're talking about here? We're talking about the total amount of monetary loss as a result of the legal proceedings associated with fraud, insider tradings, antitrust, anti-competitive behavior, market manipulation, malpractice, etc. So, so that's sort of the what actually happened, the 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 the, the bad instances. Another metrics is what you know how you actually dealing with that. And, and there's a metrics there is description of whistleblower policies and procedures. And you can see that these are very much designed to capture the, um, the business as, as, uh, ethics aspects of, of, of the industries. And by the way, this business ethics uh, uh, disclosure topic is one of the common uh, disclosure topics across a number of industries. So, to follow what I just said, uh, for the next set of the uh, sli uh, slides, I'm going to focus on a set of common dis disclosure topics that cut across multiple industries in in the, under the financial sector. So we already talked about business assets. The others are incorporation of ESG factors in key activities, selling, lending practice, and transparency of disclosure data security and privacy, systematic risk management. So I'll try to get into a little bit more details of each one of them, um, time uh, allowing. So the first one, uh, business ethics. Uh, you know, we, so first, uh, you know, just, just to reinforce the notion why this matter, we're talking about concrete dollar and cents here. I don't think this audience need to be convinced of that, but just to further drive the points, if you look at the graph on the right-hand side, the global AOM finds, um, this is based the study up to April, 2019. And you can see it's 
on the rise. And uh, this is uh, uh, probably could argue that it's a, a multiple factors playing there. One is just increasing attention being paid to it and increasing um, awareness of this. Uh, uh, and, and that helped to explain part of the why the increase of the, uh, the, uh, the, the fines. Now the question would, would uh, as, as we, we actually alluded in the last slides, the question we're really trying to address here are how has the prepared the firm performed on preventing fraud, uh, insider trading, antitrust, uh, and other set of just unethical or illegal behaviors? So this is a the on the you know what transpired, how the firms had been behave, behaving on these on these type of unethical, uh, illegal malpractice, etc. And perhaps more important is how the company actually is doing to address. So so how does the company ensure the effectiveness of its the the policy in place? around the whistleblowing but timely identification of these activities within the firm. And naturally, um, the counting metrics are basically addressing those questions. The first one is because we're talking about specific instance, so we can quantify that. We're quantifying the, the, the dollar monetary loss due to, to, due to those type of activities. And the, the unit measure is, is the same reporting um, uh, in the same reporting currency. Uh, the second matrix is very much uh, qualitative in terms of discussion and analysis. Um, so that's the business ethics. Uh, moving on to the disclosure topics of incorporation of ESG factors in key activities. Uh, this is very much uh, a matrix for portfolio level risk and opportunity exposures. Um, you know, what are the ESG factors? If you um, take the commercial banks as an example, there's a set of direct impacts. We're talking about data security, business as, uh, ethics, as we talk about financial uh, uh, inclusion, literacy, uh, literacy, systematic risk, right? Um, we already talked about the um, business ethics here and in, in, in the next few slides, we'll also touch on uh, data security. The indirect impact really come from, you know, how you incorporate these in your uh, lending activities, in your credit risk analysis of borrowers. So for the, in the case of specific, you know, for, for the commercial banks, the accounting measure, uh, the metrics are commercial industry credit exposures by industry and these um, are quantitative measures and in terms of the reporting uh, currency. And then we're asking the description of how, the, how you approach, your approach to incorporate these ESG factors into the quit analysis, which have impact in your lendings. And uh, you know, the, the nature of, of these disclosures is very much qualitative in terms of discussion analysis. You know, I want to highlight that um, the ESG uh, factors, incorporating factors in, in these key activities is not something new. It has really become a mainstream uh, business practice. So to drive the points, the right-hand side of this uh, slide shows you, uh, this is based on a survey conducted by the Fitch rating on type of sort of business practice where ESG is used and uh, in a different color uh, describe the frequency always from always to most of the times to sometimes to rarely, right? If I want to, you know, I, I, I would like to encourage you to focus the, your eyeballs on the green and blue colors. And you can see that uh, more than 60% of the survey respondent are in, uh, incorporating ESG in their risk optimization. And if you go down uh, the category of the, of the business practice, and you can see 
most of them are uh, above 50 percent and except pricing now i want to um so so hopefully you from from from, from this you can see that it is well accepted common practice that ESG is important factors in the risk related set of business practice. Now on the other side of the coin of finance, we're talking about risk and return on the pricing side. And that percentage is small, uh, relative is you know, re uh, less than 50%, but I want to say it's actually rapidly increasing. And we do see that, that the capital market want to uh, incorporate, are incorporating the ESV factors in the valuation, in the pricing. Uh, in fact, actually, uh, this is one of our ISSB's mission is that to provide the transparency to enable uh, the sustainability related factors, you know, get used in the capital formation, in the capital flow. Um, uh, so moving on to next um, uh, a, a disclosure topic that is, that is common across a number of industries. So namely selling and lending practice and the transparency of disclosure. Again, the right-hand side of graph shows that, you know, there are empirical evidence to demonstrate that why this is relevant. Just look at the distribution of the settlement and damage due to um, the male practice, um, you know, lack of uh, transparency in, in their disclosures. And you can see that we're really talking about real money, dollar census there. And, and, and they're just, you know, it's quite prevalent if these institutions uh, are not careful. So in terms of specific metrics, uh, we're, 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 you know, we're talking about here, um, we listed on the left-hand side. So just, just call out a few, you know, performance of product, customer uh, complaints, customer retention rate, et cetera, uh, incentive structures, uh, elimination, et cetera. This is, again, it's really to drive the transparency about how uh, firms in these industries primarily in mortgage, uh, in, in loan origination, cost, uh, consumer finance, and in, in investment advice uh, business activities. Moving on to the next uh, common disclosure topic, data security and privacy. Uh, first, you know, want to highlight the importance of this topic. The top uh, panel of the right-hand side of, of, of the uh, slides shows you the survey results of, of the cu what, what customer care about. And you can see that, well, we're, all of us are customers of these financial products, and we can totally relate to that. We care about our own data security and privacy. Um, then you look at, again, the statistics of the, the total data breach lost or stolen by countries. And, you know, the pretty much all the, everybody, all the countries uh, on this planet, unfortunately, uh, have incidents, you know, lost or stolen. And, uh, I, you know, sadly, you know, it's probably that, that uh, the instance of the statistics are increasing. And this is probably our, the statistic of reported or realized, and there's probably also unreported, unrealized instances. Um, so the, the, the topics, the, the disclosure topics, the question we're trying to address here are, how do the firms identify and address the vulnerability and the stress as well as, uh, as preventing data security uh, breaches? Uh, how do the companies manage leveraging um, uh, customer personal data or revenue opportunities in, 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 in with maintaining cus uh, consumer privacy? I guess the second point is many of these uh, financial institutions use our data uh, in marketing uh, uh, purpose. 
And that's where the issue of customer privacy and the security come in uh, as well. Now, in terms of specific metrics, we're talking about number of data breach breaches, percentage involving um, personal uh, you know, uh, PID information, number of accounts uh, holders affected, number of accounts holders uh, uh, when information is used uh, for a second purpose, total amount of monetary uh, losses as a result of legal proceedings associated with customer privacy. Now, these are all hopefully all very intuitive, obvious. You know, one thing I want to highlight is that in these, in the, in, in the days of internet, mobile and et cetera, when we talk about data security and privacy, there's a tendency to just to focus on the cyber aspect of this. And if you look at this, this is more than cover, cover the what's actually in the computer, uh, on the computer, on the internet, uh, server, cloud, et cetera. Uh, if you have a paper file and it's misplaced, it, cons you know, it cons uh, uh, consists of sensitive customer information data, that's also a breach of, of, of the, the, the duty of the, the financial firm, firm uh, on, on this. So it's not just um, you know, digital information. Uh, it's, it's just you know, the cover, the pl plain old fashioned paper related as well. Uh, so I covered, uh, I gave you an example of um, uh, a set of common disclosure topics. Let me just highlight a, a few additional disclosure topics uh, that are, are relevant and, and today would not have time to cover. Uh, and they're, you know, all of them we deem material and obviously important. Um, financial literacy, so namely financial literacy and in, uh, inclusion, employment, uh, and, and this is very much relevant to, to the firms have customer facing aspect. So banks, asset management, et cetera. Uh, and, and on that, I should also uh, highlight the fact that this financial literacy inclusion has both the risk aspect as, as, as well as the return aspect. Uh, just look at how many, uh, what's the size of unbanked population. And that's a huge untapped uh, market for many of the financial institutions. Uh, employment compensation risk taking, and that's probably especially relevant for, for uh, investment banks, promoting efficient capital markets by exchanges, that's, that's relevant for market exchanges, climate exposures for insurance, uh, insurance product that incentivize uh, responsible behaviors, and those are relevant for in insurance. So these are the additional topics. Uh, the last, and not the least, I want to highlight an incoming requirement that uh, as SASB standards is adopting based on the uh, development of S2. You know, that's the ISSB uh, climate disclosure requirement. In the um, uh, S2, which will be published by the end of uh, this month, we are asking uh, uh, disclosure of scope one, two, and three. Um, so here we're emphasizing scope three for this part of the discussion. And in the context of, um, and, and we're asking uh, across all 15 categories, obviously when material, and uh, we're asking prepared uh, uh, to use GHG protocol uh, value chain, the scope three uh, standard. And we we're asking disclosure, not just to what, we'll also ask them to disclose on the information and how. Now, how this manifested for the financial sectors uh, is that as part of the application guidance of, of S2, we're asking um, companies uh, in three industries, uh, asset management, commercial banks, insurance, for the investment part of the business, not the underwriting part of the business, we're asking them to disclose finance emission. Uh, and this is very much the category 15 of the GHE uh, protocol. This, what, what are the specific uh, metrics we're asking? We're asking the finance the emission scope one, two, and three by industry and asset classes. 
this is the emission amount as well as the corresponding financial ex exposure, uh, the associated carrying amount for these uh, for these emissions. We're also asking uh, the description of the methodology, how uh, the emissions are measured. And the, in the event that um, uh, the covered assets is not 100% of, of, of the institution's uh, total asset base, and we would like to know what's the percentage covered. And these metrics by and large cut across commercial banks and insurance. And for asset management, um, there's a slight variations. We're, we're not asking the breakdown uh, by industries, um, uh, but we are uh, because actually a lot of asset managers disclose uh, do quite a bit of dis dis disaggregation according to what they deem are relevant. So for example, around product portfolio or type of strategies. So, so SASB are um, you know, under the, you know, the umbrella of ISSB. So we're taking this into the SASB standard um, as, as, you know, as we go out S2. So uh, this will become an integral part of the SASB standard for financial sectors. So um, I want to highlight that um, as you see, in case you, um, as Nididi and, and uh, Apiro mentioned that SASB standard uh, is a very powerful uh, uh, investor-friendly decisive usefulness uh, framework. And when we design it, we're also very confident about the cost as, uh, if, uh, aspect for the prepare. And that's why you see the very uh, wide adoption of, of the of, of SASB standard. In the case of financial sectors, as uh, since 2021, we have um, 366 uh, financial firms spread out globally across all the regions. Um, using uh, um, the SASB standard, financial sec sector standard. And this includes six come from uh, uh, Middle East and Africa. And let me just uh, show you, uh, you know, some of logos to drive the points that you can see that on this, there's very wide spectrum of, of financial institutions that are using SASB financial sector standard. You got from you know you know some of the largest such as UBS, JP Morgan, uh, Itawood to uh, you know institutions in 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 you know in Africa, investment tech in Latin America, uh, the, um, you know uh, Bank uh, Banco Colombia, etc. And uh, so so this is really we're looking at you know household names. You know obviously uh, we're we're not being complacent. We would like you know, all the financial institutions to use the SASB standard. And, you know, that's why we're here today. Uh, so with that, um, let me, uh, maybe this is a, a good point to pause and see um, if there's any questions we can entertain. Okay, thank you, Jing, for that. Um interesting presentation. We have um, some questions have been answered. We have another one that has just been put up and it says, will these standards become mandatory? And if so, by when? So, um, the, Nididi, would you like to take this one? Sorry, I don't mean to uh, give you a hard one. Probably you're, well, no doubt you will be in much better position to answer that question. Jing, I was happy to let you let you begin, and I was just going to add on to it. Okay. And I in turn was going to call on. Okay, so please lead. Please. I will build on that. Also, just to add a few comments to your presentation, and I will ask the Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria to be on standby. Also, if they're on the line to complete the response, it's a very important question, very viable question. Over to you, Jing. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so the um, ISSB has um, the board 
and EDD is one of the member, has voted to make uh, the earliest effective date of S1, S2, uh, January 2024, which means that the reporting would cover uh, the period is starting January 2024. Now, that's the minimum, that's the starting points. You know, obviously the jurisdiction, you know, after we publish the requirement, the jurisdiction, if they choose, can pick a date earlier than that because the standard is already out. And the jurisdiction may also pick a date that they think it's most suitable to their um, specific situations. Now, the SASB standard is a volunteer standard. And uh, in terms of the effective, yeah. so the disclosure topic we talk about here today, other than the financed emission, see, it's already in effect. And with financed emission, that comes from the S2. So the minimum, the, the earliest effective date is the same as, um, as S2. And again, and also it could be sooner than that. You know, if, 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 if firms decides to, to apply that immediately, then it's, that's their choice. Nididi, hopefully uh, I covered the, the basics. So please do add. No, you absolutely did. Thanks a lot, Jing. So um, very quickly, I just want to, I know we have more than Nigerians on the call. We have Nigerians and a number of other jurisdictions that have joined the Nigerian delegation I'm seeing Dr. Anyahar is connecting to audio. We have Nig joined. Doc. Doc, just go on mute for a second, and then I'll hand over to you. Um, but I've joined the Nigerian delegation to actually have this webinar. So the first point to note is that the IFRS sustainability standards are built for capital markets and for investors. So in fact, the financial sector which is what we're speaking to today, is absolutely critical to what we're doing. Secondly, is we launched the Adoption Readiness Working Group two days ago, anchored by the Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria, which is mandated in Nigeria to adopt and mandate these standards. And yes, they're going to be mandatory. And yes, indeed, the proposed effective date from the IFRS Foundation is 1st of January, 2024. But the reason why the Adoption Readiness Working Group has been implemented in Nigeria as a multi-stakeholder group, which includes NGX, which includes all the regulators, SEC, Central Bank of Nigeria, who was present, um, Nikon, and a number of other regulators, as well as a number of preparers, is to ensure that this reduces and eases the cost and burden of reporting and sustainability-related and climate-related disclosures for preparers. Doesn't make it worse, but makes it better. It's really important to, to understand that. And given the, the fact that climate-related disclosures are priority globally, if you're watching Europe, you'll see that there's actually scope one, scope two, and scope three disclosures that are going to be mandatory. So in other words, any African company that's linked to being doing business in Europe is going to be obliged to, to actually comply with those standards. The way that the ISSB is structuring itself is one, and let me just speak from an African point of view. We know, because I, I sit on the board for Africa, we know that the IFRS accounting standards are familiar to African countries, jurisdictions, regulators, and preparers, one. Two, the definition of familiarity, as I responded to in the chat, is the same in the accounting standards as it is in the sustainability standards. Three, the objective is to ensure that sustainability-related disclosures as risks and opportunities are embedded into your financial statements. So that if there's a connectivity between your financial disclosures and your sustainability and climate-related disclosures. And four, the idea, and I'll answer another question that Adenike Olawoye has asked, the idea is to build a building block approach so that the ISSB standards are a global baseline. That global baseline is interoperable with GRI. There is an MOU between IFRS Foundation and GRI to ensure that there is interoperability. And if you're already doing GRI, 
it will help you comply with S1 and S2, which is unlike GRI, which is voluntary, S1 and S2 will be mandatory. Just like your IFRS accounting standards are mandatory. And the Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria is in the best position to state when that will happen. There's another question by Faith Ariba, which says, how do you merge the requirements of S1 and S2 with that of the SASB standards and will one supersede the other? That's, this is where I'll end my comment. Um, the objective of the IFRS standards is to bring together the multiplicity of standards and create one single truly global baseline so that you can refer to one set of standards that builds on TCFD, that builds on the SASB industry metrics. And in that context, the industry metrics are a proportionality and scalability measure. So in other words, they have already done the work to find, find out what are the likely material metrics that will matter to your industry. And there are 77 industry-specific metrics that have been identified. So in other words, the encouragement of S1 and S2, which you will hold in your hands on June the 26th, is pick up a set of SASB industry metrics and standards that align with your industry and start with these metrics, which are on average, there will be six topics and there will be 13 metrics that will apply to you and will help you begin to identify the risks and opportunities that are linked to your industry and that actually help you become a more resilient company and also meet and identify those data requirements that investors require for you to unlock capital going forward. So was, that was a bit long. I'm gonna keep quiet now. Hand over to FRCN to respond to the question of when um, beyond ISSP requirements, and then over to you, Antonia, to ask the rest of the question. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ndidi, for that intervention, um, which tried, which attempted to cover almost all the issues. As at the question of when, um, it is quite obvious that uh, Nigeria had sent their intent of being an early adopter. And uh, this is anchored on the Federal Executive Council approval of uh, July 28, 2010, mandating the adoption of global standards in the area of accounting, financial reporting, auditing, and corporate governance. And that is why we look at it from the perspective of unlocking um, capital, like uh, Dr. Ndidi has tactically explained. If you are doing business with the globe, you have to play on the same benchmark the globe is playing. You wouldn't be doing business and you say it's a global village. You want to have your own different standards. We want comparability. We want verifiability. If you are not um, reporting based on a global baseline, comparability becomes uh, problematic and investors will only go to the areas they understand what the reporting pattern is all about. We are trying to mainstream this and I see it as a corporate behavior change. It's not just reporting thing. If you are talking about uh, sustainability reporting, you are reporting what you are doing, not green, greenishing anything. So uh, I think we should not be looking at, are we adopting because it's a global standard? No, we are adopting because it is what doing. We are adopting because we want to unlock uh, capital for, for all, Nigerians to get involved in what is, <coughs> excuse me, in what is happening globally. As at when, we want to carry everybody along and that is the essence of establishing Adoption Readiness Working Group. We are studying and we're inviting um, comments from all stakeholders. We are conducting studies to find out when appropriate. Are we doing a big bang? Are we doing a phase approach? Which one will suit Nigeria first? I think um, immediately after the release of um, IFRS S1, S2, expected on June 26, Financial Reporting Council will be able to make known um, how and when we are adopting. Let me not take time because I know another session is starting. Thank you, and I hope this is helpful. God bless.
Thank you, Doctor. There are a few other questions uh, that we can take as part time permits us. So this question says, I'm trying to merge the requirement of the IFRS S1 and S2 of the ISSB with the SASB standards. Okay. I think that question has been answered. Okay, so uh, the next one, what in your own opinion would have been responsible for the low usage of sustainability standards before now? Is it because of its complicity of cost? That's uh, okay. Jing, you want sure. to take that? Um, okay. Jing, 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 if you can also take the other question at the same time. In companies where these standards have been adopted, did research show they witnessed increases in share price? And we have exactly one minute to respond to this before okay. the next session. All right, let me go. All the questions okay. will be responded to in FAQ. Okay. The first one is I just just quickly, um, the the part of this low usage is because of the lack of comparability and uh, the consistent set of information. I think that will be addressed by the ISSB's S1, S2. I think that will increase significantly the usage adoption. On the second question about the about the share price, uh, it's a great question. It's a very complicated one. The I, I can say that there are plenty of empirical, academic, very rigorous research demonstrating that sustainability-related factors do affect the valuation of the preparers. And we can take offline. I can give you a very long list of those studies uh, related to climate. And there are similar studies for other. So, and um, it, by the way, I, my, in my, my pr previous professional life, I was really focusing on quantifying the financial impact of various risk drivers and the sustainability related, especially climate is one of the key drive, drive, drivers. And they're actually increasingly become, becoming important. So forgive me that this is a very brief answer, you know, we'll be happy to follow up uh, with me. Okay. Thank you, Jing. Uh, I think uh, we are all not, we've run out of time. And so we need to bring this session to a close. Uh, Dr. Ndidi, do you have something uh, you want to add? Not at all. I'm just hoping that either Tenu or Dr. Anyara will close the session for us so we can start the next. And if not, thank you very much to everyone. Um, I hope you found this useful. Tenu, I see you're here. Please give the closing word. All right. Thank you very much to everyone. Uh, this has been a very good uh, time together with you talking about uh, these issues once again in financial services. Uh, we're grateful that we have uh, over 250 participants still interested, engaged to the end. It's not the end of the learning. We're still going to go on. Uh, in the interest of time, I will shut down now and um, so that we can go on to the next session. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Zank. Thank you. Thank Have, you. A good Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Have a good afternoon.